Hi, everybody. So I'm Alex. Um, I've been working for, with Beam or well, Dataflow in the early access of Dataflow. So I've been working with Beam for a while. Uh, so so that's good. Thing. I'm a, a principal system architect at Colibra, um, more tailored toward kind of the operations part. So we actually built some nice things with Beam and uh, with the SRE team. Um, that crunches our open telemetry data. So we started kind of two years ago. Oh, by the way, yeah, Colibra is kind of a, a SaaS product that kind of manages all your metadata uh, data, uh, finds out the lineage, and and way lots and lots more. But uh, that's the product that actually sends out the telemetry data in the sellers, and we do stuff with it. So. Telemetry, first of all, let's quickly go over what telemetry is. Like you have three pillars, like everybody knows what metrics are, even while you're not using directly, because it's one of the oldest ones. Even like in the Middle Ages, when you have steam, steam engines, you had like metrics, you know, the pressure gawk of those steam engines, like it's typically a metric or like in this picture with all those meters in the airplane, all kind of metrics. They change, they count, they go up. So you basically have like two big kind of parts. One of them is a, a gauge, like uh, like the steam engine, or your speed meter, or you have a counter or some that's kind of your odometer in your car that only goes up and up and up. Um, and they're fine for lots of use cases, but they have the inherent kind of characteristic that they're aggregated. So you kind of lose some resol uh, resolution. So let's go to the next one, and it's kind of logs. Logs is kind of, well, everybody knows logs. Uh, no, but it does even does other developers as a printf statement. It's kind of a log as well. Um, but if you do it right, you can get like way more um, information in your logs. Like, for example, the distance traveled in your metric, you can actually, if you do it kind of like in Strava or whatever thing, you kind of constantly log where you are, you can actually derive that metric from the log. Uh, and the nice thing is you can aggregate that over time or see in history and go back. So you can have like way more business values out of your logs. So, um, but you have to do it right. So, but ex uh, up to the next pillar and traces, it's kind of loss plus plus um, because it's kind of a loss statement, but it has kind of a parent. So uh, you can typically have like an endpoint in your application that goes to the next layer. So that next, next layer says like, I'm a new span. That's why what you call it in in traces, like every kind of beginning and end, that's a span. And what is my parent? That was kind of your rest layer. You can have like a very complex tree of things. Um, it has some business value, but I'm kind of starting to push developers more for like, if you do what you did like with your print, sta print statements, or if you want to track your, your, um, your history kind of, or what is my application doing? We're trying to push that to traces and actually push like developers for more like structured logs for getting like more business value or kind of your audit trail. So those are three pillars. So metrics, logs and traces or logs plus plus. Um, and the nice thing is a few, a few years ago, Open Telemetry started, it's kind of an initiative that's not run by kind of a single company. So it's not an open source project that's been kind of backed by one. Uh, it's kind of unique in open source that it's kind of uh, a combination of two big projects from the past, open census and open tracing. They actually said, hey, we're doing kind of overlapping things, but like a bit different. Let's put our heads together and like create something new. And that's open telemetry. So it's kind of a risky thing, but they kind of did it right. Um, so it's still a set of tools, a set of SDKs. So it's very comparable when you hear like Beam, like they also have different SDKs. So meet your developers where they are. Um, 
and kind of an API, and, and for me, kind of the most important thing, it's a model. So every trace, every log, or every trace kind of described in a correct and semantic way. It's in a protobuf, there's a schema around it, and that means you can do stuff with it. And that's what we did. So we built our, back, uh, our backbone, our telemetry backbone actually on top of open telemetry. We had like kind of three, three goals. Um, so, well, first of all, it's for observability. Um, and before it was kind of spaghetti. So we wanted to get that kind of right. But like our three kind of main goals was like be vendor independent at the collection level. Or the collection level, that means on all those thousands of VMs that we managed, we didn't want to have like, not calling out a vendor, but like a data dog agent, a Grafana agent, or whatever. We didn't want to do that on each and every machine. We just wanted to have our open telemetry collector. And that's it. So that's the lowest level. We don't want to have any vendor tinkering around with our machines. Not that we don't trust them, but like it makes us kind of independent from them at that level. Um, because, well, we got kind of screwed over in the past with the cost model of those vendors, so we, we wanted to be in control. Then the, the second thing is was owning our data. That's where the protobuf comes kind of nicely in. We know what the semantics are of each and every pillar, so we can do stuff with that. And then the thing that we're kind of building out now is like maybe at the end we want to serve some of our data back to our, uh, to our customers. Because in our product, some of our customers can run workflows, and maybe we can deliver some of the those metrics back to them. It's kind of an early phase, and it's still kind of, are we going to do it as a business, yes or no? But at least we know that we're capable of. So how did we build it? So let's start with the open telemetry collector. It's kind of a, a, a nitty, pretty interesting thing. It's also kind of a pipeline. Uh, so very familiar with uh, if you built it with uh, if you work with Beam, um, so it has an input and output and also a pipeline part. But uh, it's a very important part of the stack because that's also the thing that runs on each and every machine, or in your Kubernetes cluster on each node, and so on. But we have running it in different phases of our backbone. So let's start um, of what it is. So it's completely open source. Um, that's the link where you can find it. Everybody can download it and can start immediately with it. You can start uh, testing or investigating what your computer is doing, kind of how many CPUs and that, and you can just start with it. Just download it, execute it, or configure it, because there are so many receivers. You have to, of course, um, say which receivers it are, uh, you just need to pick the things that you're interested in. So it has a, the ability to inspect like your Postgres server, whatever. Uh, and if it's not there, you add it. So we actually contributed something, and I'll show that later. It also have different exporters. For that, we're kind of interested in one exporter. Well, no, it's not true. But at the, at the, the early stage, it's like the open telemetry protocol uh, exporter. So we are running different collectors in chains. So on the machine, it goes gRPC open telemetry out. We have the backbone. It has like ingress and then so on and so on. I'll go through it with with some some slides. Uh, you, we have processors. That's where you can do kind of have overlap with Beam. Um, you have built-in ones, uh, but I'll go deeper into that. So. Um, so, how did we start? Let's see. Uh, normally, I show the screen, but then out, out of the camera. Um, so, you can run like that machine. You can do. You can run it on your machine. You can do everything. So, you can export it to your favorite kind of tool, Grafana, Datadog, commercial. All of them are supported. Because that's the nice thing. It's not one vendor that actually backs it. They're kind of all into that, all of them. I actually don't know of a vendor that's not having exported for that. And they, they, I think they need to be there, otherwise they can 
probably lose kind of the fight because I'm really convinced that it will take over telemetry world at the end as it's kind of doing it now. Um, so that's a simple thing to start, but that doesn't work if you have 6,000 machines. Um, even on a cluster, you run one collector per node that inspects like the data of the node. You have an, it uh, sends everything to another collector in your cluster that combines your characteristics or attributes of your cluster, and that sends it then out to whatever, like your, your vendor. Um, so we have that on VMs or whatever. You can do it that. That way, you can export to directly to kind of your vendor. That works, but at our scale, it doesn't work it anymore. So we need even something kind of in between. So we have one dedicated Kubernetes cluster that actually collects all the open telemetry data of all the machines. It's thousands and thousands of machines and dozens of clusters that sends data to the, it. It's like the same collector, the same executable, just configured differently. Um, that actually receives that open telemetry data. You, have, you only need one endpoint on the internet and you send it to, to that one. And then we come into streams. So what we missed, um, so, well, we have one endpoint, we export, we send that to other collectors that have dedicated output to the vendors, but maybe we missed something in between. And that's what we wrote at our company. We actually contributed the cloud PubSub exporter receiver and exporter because it sends all open telemetry data into PubSub and we also have one that actually reads it. So you can actually create a, a topic and a subscription, put either at either end an open telemetry collector and you have like a, a nice streaming system. So then it looks like this. It gives already kind of the plus side that it can buffer data typically on seven, like seven days, pops up as retention of seven days. So something goes wrong anywhere it exports. You have the buffer. It's nice to have. It was not our main goal, but this was our main goal. So once it's on pop top, we can do beam uh, there. So we can get way more information or extract or, well, crunch our own data. So we can do everything that we want, push it to observability systems, but now we have a way to hook into that stream. Because that's what actually vendors don't like. If you put like your agent on your machine, it sends it directly to that product. And if you want to kind of get value back of that product, you have to read it out. We didn't want to do that because we didn't know what the data was. So we can actually just hook into that. So we've put some, some uh, beam pipelines in between. So in between the input and output. Most of them are streaming pipelines. So 95% is streaming for us. Uh, this is the number that we have. We can't compete with like in the morning, like with Intuit with like, or uh, the other web people with like 200 and, and some pipelines. We can, can, can't compete with that because we have one, one and a half kind of team. So um, those, that's only, we have just a dozen of them. And uh, this is graph. It already get, it gets kind of big enough to manage with uh, with a small team. So I'm I'm going through a few of these use cases that actually everybody can start with. So if you want to start with Beam, and telemetry is like a great thing to start. Every company can get like way more value out of that telemetry data. You don't realize how much value that is. So the first thing is kind of attribute enrichment. So normally you configure like at your machine, this is this machine, this is maybe for this customer, and that's it. You put some attributes out there, and that's fine for your observability system. You see which graphs, nice, and so on. But if you want to do kind of statistics, there are way more things that you actually want to inject, depending on kind of the statistics you, you do. Like, for example, this customer is like, is a prospect and so on. If you then want to see kind of aggregate everything with prospects, um, 
and you can you can do that and it's way easier to do that kind of in post than actually kind of ask your infrastructure team to can you add this label or can you add this label or can you add this label and doing it actually in post if you run your data on in batch later on if you have it, it, your function that enriches your data written correctly you can do that in on historical data as well so even when that was not set and that machine, you just can do that like in post-production. So a few examples is for this is this tenant, uh, this is this kind of environment. Or this, like. um, another kind of in this category um, is kind of not enrichment, but sampling, uh, sampling. And this is on trace. So the previous attributes was for all metrics. But on trace, we kind of do 100% tracing on all our machines. That's normally not how you do it. Normally you do it like 5% tracing of all your calls. We do 100% tracing. Why? Because we are kind of single tenant on some machines. If you do 5%, you lose too much data to actually do something useful because they are, your percentage are scattered around so many tenants. Well, you're, there's that one tenant that you're interested in. So, we actually do 100% uh, sampling at the source, but eventually we don't want to kind of get like 100% data in our observability system, but we want to do analysis on 100%. So we kind of do in Beam, just do our sampling there. For example, our uh, traces go to a cloud trace from Google. If we wouldn't do that, our bill, bill would be magnificently higher <laughs> for cloud traces because it's already kind of a significant part uh, if we did do that. The nice thing is that we can do that even while normally you set your percentage on your machines. We can do that now in posts. We push a configuration in, in, big, uh, in big table or whatever your, your configuration is stored. Like every so often in our pipeline, we actually refresh that sampling rate and it's actually almost like a few minutes later we are uh, sampling 100% or lower. Um, but it's kind of in the same category. It's like it's in the stream or you enrich or you actually downsample. Um, well, so pretty simple things. Uh, most of the use cases are pretty simple, but it's just to show you that's kind of how valuable you can get out of your telemetry data. So why did we do, not do it kind of with the collector? I already hinted at, about it. Like, for example, uh, on the collector, you actually then do it on the machine or so on, actually in our pipelines, it's easier because we, we can do it then kind of in batch processing as well. The collector is really created for kind of doing, it's not made for, for batch processing. So Beam is, has like the dual, mo dual model, right? So you can do it in batch. So if you run your code, you can do it in streaming and then go in batch as well. So that's the main reason to why we do it in uh, our Beam pipeline. Um, but I've already hinted at like historical data, then of course you kind of do the backups. Again, uh, we started pretty early in open telemetry. Now you can do it in the collector, the backup, uh, but we actually were, one of the first things we needed was backup. So we wrote our own backup. That pipeline just is a few lines of code. It's like we encapsulate our proto in another row. Uh, it's, it sounds weird, but it's kind of fine. Um, we kind of, I don't like to invent the wheel. I looked at the cloud event kind of, um, cloud event spec for doing the cloud pop up uh, solution as well. And it's actually very nicely mapped on Avro because there's also kind of a way to store whatever there is on your pop up into Avro and that's what we did. And we set like a window of 15 minutes and every 15 minutes a single file is written and we have a backup since kind of the beginning of time. So then Beam just doesn't, it, it just doesn't kind of bother. Like every 15 minutes we have two gigs of data and that's the amount of value that, uh, volume that we have. It's pretty manageable. Uh, and that's how it look. We actually have like uh, three different kind of Beam pipelines in one data, in, in one, well, three different pipelines in one uh, pipeline. How do you call it like that? In the beginning, we did like mixed the data all by one, but uh, 
it's better to kind of uh, have every pillar separately because we saw that historically you only work with one. You don't work with all the three pillars at the same time. So it saves some uh, filtering afterwards. So per metri metric traces and, and logs are, they have their own kind of file. Uh, and then for analysis, so then you can do analysis. Uh, it turns out that most of our use cases are around API usage. So we have a few use cases that uh, are around API usage. I'm going to show you two. Uh, one is traces. So that's like typically how a trace looks like. So you have the beginning, uh, you have some select statements, and one of them is uh, one of the calls that is interesting, our internal Java API. Why are we interested in that? Because our customers can run directly to our Java API. So we wanted to see who is using what, where is, does it come from? But it can be pretty complex because it's very low, low level. But sometimes it goes to the rest and sometimes it kind of internal with some groovy codes and so on. So uh, we kind of wrote kind of a beam pipeline to work on those traces. Um, it turned out pretty easy to write. Um, just with the traces, it looks like a tree. It's very complex. Um, but what we just did, like only to only extract the data that we know it need for each pen, see who the parent is, and actually kind of flatten it out. So we do kind of some B magic for extraction, go to the row SQL kind of model, and then write write a problem in SQL. In, uh, in Beam SQL. So it's like one Java pipeline with the, jo the, the SQL embedded, and we have our answer. And for the deep analysis, we do, don't do kind of the real-time analysis. We pump everything to, into BigQuery, and then we give it to smart people that then can go slice and dice uh, the, the problems. So that's what we do. So this is the SQL. It's a bit longer <laughs> than that to, to solve our pro problem, uh, and that's it. So it was pretty easy. So you can do SQL if you extract your data right on your trace that data, and, and that's it. So other kind of things is kind of uh, already hinted that like metrics were kind of uh, aggregated. Well, here you can actually start to create metrics out of your logs. So, and that's what we that what we did. One of the use, cool use cases is open API. Uh, so your load balancer logs, like the thing that is closest to your customer, has like all the data needed to kind of reverse map to the open API spec. So for, for example, if you have like slash rest slash asset, it's, it is, it, it's described somewhere in open API spec and in the open API spec uh, well, it's too dark here on the slides but like there's something called an operation ID and it's kind of very compatible as a, like like a method uh, we do reverse map that so if you see that on kind of, we, we wrote a reverse mapper from kind of logs to open API spec and we get an operation open uh, operation ID then I like specs, so I'm a spec nerd. So I then used kind of transferred that into a semantically descriptive span. Uh, so I go actually to, to traces. Why? Because it's very well described. And from there on, I go to HTTP metrics. So for each operation ID, we now have like, uh, what is the duration, the request size, and the response size, and then I give all the data to my colleague there, <laughs> and he makes a nice draft around it. So it was pretty easy to do. Like uh, we did th this kind of in a dev break, uh, but we do that in, in in Beam. So also kind of a simple use case, but uh, but super super long, uh, super interesting. And then the interesting part is kind of what we do. We do with those uh, calculated metrics or uh, other data or even pure metrics, we start to do classifications. So this is becoming interesting for us because like, as we have so many machines, 
if we go to an observability tool that does that, or, or it runs like, say you have 6,000 machines, you do 6,000 kind of queries against that database, or that vendor builds us like a lot of money for those machines. We can do it very easily in Beam. We just kind of partition per machine or per tenant or whatever our problem is and describe or, and create kind of a feature uh, a feature vector uh, out of it like that tenant has like on those APIs so much latency and so on and so on. So now we just make it bigger. And then we kind of kind of describe if it, is that the, that machine or that customer in problem yes or no. So and if yes, we can actually fire them events from Beam. So, so the, all kind of observability problems that we actually do in Beam. So so and then for that and that's for kind of an early stage we're kind of seeing if we can serve that data back. And again, it's kind of the same data, uh, same kind of uh, data flows that we run, or Apache Beam code that runs, and we store it instead of pushing it next to the next pub subtopic, we store it kind of in big table and uh, serve it back, because like those protests are, are, are very good to kind of combine. Um, and serve back. So conclusion, so what, what we learned, so in our learnings, so, we tried a few things. We thought first, like the previous in previous company I worked with Beam, we did most of the things with the row, um, the Beam row. So we can do way, way more in SQL. Actually, we learned here. Actually, we do everything proto. Proto in, proto out, but like intermediate, we had some conventions that's also proto. So that, that make, made it way more easier and it was way more type safe because if you go to a row, it's kind of hard to manage uh, manage your schemas, and it's not so type safe into a into a type safe language. Um, and from there on, it's uh, pretty much proto out or or go directly to something like BigQuery or Big, or Big Table and Elastic. We do all of them. Um, so that's that's the learnings. What would we do different? The thing now is. Uh, this kind of all kind of in the kind of uh, operation side, and we started out with Java because it was the the most mature, <laughs> most mature mature uh, SDK. So um, I would go for the the Go now because it's kind of, but yeah, that, that's just uh, GA. Um, why? Because like it's probably easier to find Go people in that space than, um, than Java people. So just it's for hiring, it's way more easier. So, and that's about it. So thank you.